In Civ 6 or Civilization 6, you're playing a game. Games are meant to be fun. So today I'm giving my top 5 most fun civs and leaders to play in Civilization 6. Whether it be throwing out nukes in the ancient era or conquering the world without firing a single shot in 20 turns, these are some of the most fun civs you can play in the game. But what do you think? Comment down below any other fun civs or ideas you might have, and leave a like if you do enjoy the video as it does help out the channel a ton. Let's start with Eleanor. If you dream of conquering the world but want to morally abide by the Geneva Convention, then Eleanor might be the Civ for you. It takes a while to get started since early game great works are harder to find than fans at a little Zan concert, but by the time the mid game rolls around and you have ancient shoes and the Mona Lisa and stuff like that, you can at the very least grab one or two cities, which turns into four to five cities, which turns into the entire world at the blink of an eye. It's absolutely insane. The Great Works each give other cities minus two loyalty every turn for each Great Work, and with Eleanor, you can skip the free city phase and immediately take control of the city after the loyalty falls to zero. Different modifiers like finding a religion and growing your cities to be thick with capital double C's is going to help you take those cities easier, but aim for a golden age in the era where you want to push for the city swiping. Whether it be the medieval or renaissance era, once you get the first couple of cities and more sites for great works, your snowball can continue, as each city gives more slots for great works and great people points, letting you take over any game in the span of just 20 turns. This can even be done in a one city challenge, as yes, with just one city and some wonders, void singers, and maybe even a religion, you can easily steal a couple cities with just your capital. And speaking of void singers, they are by far the best secret society for Eleanor giving you the old god obelisk for faith and another great work slot for each obelisk. And by the time you get cultists, not only do they also reduce loyalty, helping you speed up your conversions a little, but it also gives you more great works than you'll know what to do with, with the fact that after using their last charge, they immediately give you a relic. The civ you want to pick is probably France as English Eleanor. It doesn't get too many bonuses, although with all the extra gold you get, I guess you could trade away all that money for great works. That probably works. But with France, you have Wonder Construction and Chateaus for more culture, which better aligns with Eleanor and can help you win a culture victory if you want. And the Gerald Imperial lets you wipe out any nearby neighbors dumb enough to spawn in your rightful territory, which is going to be the entire world before turn 150. The unique unit lets you take out any holdouts like maybe Carthage in a domination game that would otherwise be harder or in Carthage's case impossible to get. And finally, by taking more cities, you'll get more great work slots and great works in general, just by the virtue of more theater squares for more great people points, which lets you stack the great works in border cities and use an unstoppable avalanche of loyalty debuffs that can even begin to take away Civ cities when they are in a golden age, which might seem impossible to some, but I have some Eleanor games on this channel where I I think I took, uh, I don't know, they were in a golden age and I ended up taking their cities back when I actually posted Civilization VI gameplay content. Although next video is going to be actual gameplay, so subscribe to not miss out on that. Come on, you know I can't have a Civilization VI most fun leaders without the only leader who looks like he's on every substance in existence. Hammurabi has probably the single most broken ability in the entire game, giving you the full tech if you get the Eureka for it meaning planes in the ancient era. You can build mines, a factory, workshop, and evolve into your alter ego, Osama bin Rabi, flying planes into medieval enemy villages, and honestly, if you play on Prince, I wouldn't be surprised if you could start kamikaze your enemies in the classical era. But that is only the most well-known strategy for Babylon. Even with the negative 50% science modifier, you can still get research labs and universities by no later than the medieval era, so you'll still have the most science in the game for the most part. And with the fact that the wonders you get are pretty much guaranteed, like Ruhr Valley and Oxford, hell, Kilwa is pretty much automatic too if you go for it. You will have the most science in the game and can probably easily win a sub-200 victory in the right situation. But the best non-cheese strategy for Babylon is probably a culture victory. You still go flight early on while trying to get as much culture as possible and trying to get an improvement city-state, someone like Rapa Nui, to get tourism out of that cultural tile improvement. You'll have such a huge advantage in early tourism, plus sniping all the tech tree wonders you want and still using domination to take out your competitors 
The Babylonians also have a pretty great water mill in the Palgum that gives every tile near a river of that city an extra source of food and extra production, making it a supercharged water mill that will give you the population you need to build districts and advanced units, since you know, planes by 500 BC isn't cheap. But the most fun part about Babylon is the future era domination you can do. You can get crossbows in less than 20 turns from the start of the game by finding a barb camp with a slinger, and then get to field cannons and bombards not too later after, still in the ancient era. At this point, you are an absolute unstoppable monstrosity since all your units can one-shot everything, and even the walls will get shredded by your crossbows in the early game. You pretty much recreate colonization with this easy-to-use strategy, with you as the colonizer and the rest of the world as the colonizee. You can still go for cavalry and knights earlier on than usual, but that's a little overkill since our unkillable crossbowmen are strong enough, especially after the first promotion. The best thing about this, though, is the fact that you can get biplanes by the medieval to renaissance age, and the AI will have no answer for that. None. You literally stay at 100 health, one-shotting every unit in sight while attacking cities with no resistance. It's unfair. You can't even use ranged units to try to take out the plane. And I don't mean something, you know, like the biplane is hard to counter. I mean literally unstoppable in every sense of the term. You can still get actual bombers and fighters in the industrial era at the latest before anyone even has an anti-air prototype. The best they can do is shoot at you from the skies with flintlock muskets every couple of decades while your planes drop firebombs on their positions. The most fun you could probably have, even if you're not really into domination in Civilization VI, Babylon is definitely one of the top five most fun nations in the entire game. Sticking with our domination-themed exploits in Civilization VI, Byzantium is one of the best civs in the entire game, no questions asked, maybe even better than Babylon with their two unique abilities. One, taking out units gives religious pressure and converts nearby cities to your religion. And number two, cities with your religion are but naked exposed to cavalry attacks, leaving their walls useless. They can easily found a religion since every holy site gets one great profit point per turn, while also the religious spread you get from defeating units is just insane. You pretty much give them some melatonin right to the hypothalamus, and they wake up believing they're Eastern Orthodox. That's how insane the Civ 6 Dilf can be. Which, you can be just as Dilfy by leaving a like and subscribing to help out the channel, you get a few extra inches on the baby maker, and best of all, you don't miss out on future content. This type of gameplay with Byzantium is so fun since you just play the game and you end up getting huge advantages for stuff you were going to do anyway. You don't have to go out of the way because you were going to take out units anyway, and every unit you eliminate makes the next city easier to conquer, which makes the next city easier to conquer, and eventually the only thing that can stop your domination run is going to be a surprise religious victory you didn't even know you were close to. But that's not even all. With Byzantium, they have a unique entertainment complex, the Hippodrome. While unfortunately there are no hippo as a unique unit to unleash on your enemies, the AI is going to wish that was the case because every district and building you construct in the Hippodrome is going to give you a free, fully advanced cavalry unit without any limitations, the most advanced cavalry unit you can build. Absolutely ludicrously overpowered, this right here is a war crime. Straight definition of a crime against humanity. With 10 cities, you can end up timing it right, leaving the Hippodrome with one turn remaining in each city. After that, you can immediately research your Divine Right Civic to get your unique Tagma unique unit, and the second it becomes unlocked, next turn you're going to have 10 free of those unique units that cost no resources. And better yet, you could buy another 10 arenas for another 10 nights, although unless you're Mansa Musa rich, that's a little unlikely. But this bonus really scales throughout the game extremely well. The more cities you take, the more free units you can get, and even later on when you unlock new entertainment buildings like the zoo or stadium, you'll end up being able to get tanks, modern armor, just by building a new gladiator arena in every city. This free army, as well as the fact you blitz through walls like unsalted butter, means you not only have the easiest domination victory on your hands, but you also have the most disgustingly overpowered weapon of mass destruction at your disposal, giving you a great time when taking out cities, which this list is all about. Enough of all the domination and bloodshed, let's move on to a more peaceful victory type in Civilization VI, with Jay of Armin being the pseudo-religious culture victory leader. 
The Kamai have so many things that make the game just so much more satisfying to play. The fact that they have that African in them producing far more babies in population than everyone else is just a bonus with Holy Sites Near River meshing with the Pantheon that gives housing and amenities for Holy Sites Near Rivers being the River Goddess Pantheon. But the thing that makes the Kamai the Kamai is the fact that once they get the Prasad, the unique religious building, every city that has 20 population can get 20 tourism in every city, which you could probably get around the Renaissance era. The Prasad replaces the temple, so you'll be going for a religious type game, but more importantly, it gives 10 tourism to cities with 10 population, and 20 if you have 20 population. It's all or nothing, so you don't get one tourism per population or whatever, you just get the 10 or the 20. With 10 cities, you can theoretically get 200 tourism doing nothing. Literally nothing, except try to keep your population as high as possible. One of the best sieves to do that since they get bonuses to aqueducts, the river goddess pantheon, and the fact that if you found a religion early on, you could get feed the world for more food. The only thing that really limits their growth is the fact you get almost no amenities in your abilities, so you'll either have to hope entertainment complexes and luxuries are enough, which they usually are, but if you're really struggling with housing, just get neighborhoods. The Kamai are engineered for a culture victory, so going for culture will let you get neighborhoods ASAP compared to most games. This Prasad is only a bonus to tourism, as while 200 isn't going to win you the game, it's still a huge amount letting you win the game much faster, especially with the fact that the more population you have, the more loyalty pressure you exert, so you'll probably end up swiping some other leader cities through loyalty for even more tourism. But we're still not done yet, since I kinda lied at the beginning when I said this Civilization VI strategy didn't have domination in it. The Domri is a siege unit replacing the Trebuchet that is stronger and can move and fire at the same time without needing a great general. The Strength and Move and Fire ability means you can move in and leave any walls unlucky enough to be on the receiving end, like Constantinople's walls in 1453. All of this can be done in just one turn, so even if the wall somehow survives, you'll still be taking severely reduced damage when they retaliate in the next turn, as they won't be a threat anymore. This is usually the biggest hurdle in most domination games, as without walls, cities are pretty much defenseless, and with the AI's tendency to run units into suicide charges that would make Gettysburg look like a Disney movie, you don't have to worry about the AI's military too much. All of this makes the Kamai one of the most fun saves you can ever play in Civilization VI, letting you go th both for culture and domination at the same time without having to worry about the intricacies that give us headaches and culture victories, and the walls that stop us in our tracks with domination victories. And the final leader in making Civilization VI fun again is Hungary with Matthias Corvinus. The Hungarians are one of the best domination civs in the entire game, letting you levy city-state units for the tools Spongebob had as friends that one episode. Not only that, but upgrading those units is ridiculously cheap, letting you buy, upgrade, and outfit an entire advanced military for less than a McChicken and a McDonald's Sprite. With that, you can move in and wipe out whatever civs unlucky enough to be breathing the same air as you with the extra move speed and combat strength your levied units have in Civilization VI. Now, two main problems might arise from this strategy. One, you might not get the first envoy in a city-state. That's fine. Find the city-state with the least amount of envoys that's somewhat close to you, put a money in it for two envoys, and you can usually get the last one you need by the time you have swordsman researched. And you get another two envoys when you levy units, so the AI can't exactly steal the city-state in the middle of the war, leaving you with nothing but a flaccid penis in your hands trying to tear down the enemy's walls. The best thing about this strategy is adding in Himiko from the Heroes and Legends game mode. With Himiko, you act as a great general, and you can also use a charge to either add envoys or levy city-state units for free. This is huge, since not only will you get these units for literally nothing, but you'll also get swordsmen with 15 extra combat strength from Himiko, the levy bonus, and a great general, and another 4 combat strength from Oligarchy, making them almost as strong as musketmen with 1 extra move speed. After that, you can proceed to tear through the entire world until Himiko passes out and the city-state gets its troops back, which you then proceed to revive Himiko with faith, levy your troops again, and continue your march for world domination for just a little bit of faith. So, in all honesty, the Old God Obelisk is probably the best secret society for the Himiko strat, but they aren't necessarily needed. Even without Himiko, this strategy is 100% fine, with it only being a little less broken and you having to use your head a little bit more than with Himiko. 
Finally, we get the unique units. The Hussar is an absolute tool of a unit since if you have alliances after eliminating half the world so thoroughly you grew a silly mustache, then you're just cheating. But the Black Army is a different story. The Black Army gets 3 combat strength for every adjacent levied unit. With all the levying you're doing, put 3 units around the Black Army and watch the entire world crumble as 9 extra combat strength for a light cavalry unit at that stage of the game with a great general and Himiko is almost as unfair as Babylon plane rushes. Not really, but it's still pretty broken. And that's just domination for Hungary. You can still get the thermal bath as well as production for putting districts on the other side of a river for some reason, letting you build all the districts in your newly acquired cities for about 50% off, although technically it's 50% more of your production towards that district, so it's more like your building strength is 50% more, but that isn't important. With these bonuses, Hungary is one of the most fun games you will ever have and deserve a spot on this list. So let me know down below what you think about the list as well as who I should have put down below in the comments. I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.